This episode of Make Something Cool is brought to you by Riverside, the leading podcast and video recording platform. We are massive fans of Riverside. We literally use it to make every episode of Make Something Cool. We can't live without it anymore. And we are not the only ones. Guy Raz of How I Built This uses it. Gary V uses it. Companies like Spotify and the New York Times use it. It's the best. So if you are trying to record a podcast or create video content, go check out Riverside today. You can hit the link in the description and the show notes of this episode to go check it out. We couldn't recommend it enough. So go check out Riverside. This is Make Something Cool. I'm Alex Sugg, and today I am super excited to be sitting down with Ryan Booth. Ryan is an incredible filmmaker who's directed work for brands like Google, Spotify, and Amazon. He's also made multiple features on his own. And Ryan, I've been inspired by you for a super long time, so I'm really excited to have you on to talk filmmaking, creative work, and all the above. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you for a lot of reasons. I've been following your work for a long time. And I think the first thing that stuck out to me that I wanted to ask you about was storytelling. Hmm. Because at the core of what you do, you're a director, you know, you've done lots of uh, DP work in the past. You've done lots and lots of different work and all of it is it revolves around storytelling. Yep. And so I think a cool place to start is how do you, and this could be the most broad question, but I like that is uh, how do you find and develop a good story? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, that's the core of the work that I end up doing, basically, um, whether that be kind of paid work for commercial clients or, or obviously kind of in my own kind of pursuits. I would say for me, like, I think the guiding principle is curiosity. Like if something is interesting, if you feel like asking a follow up question, I feel like that to me that sense of curiosity the like I want to know a little bit more about this is a great kind of intuitive place to start for developing an idea or developing a story I think if you can kind of articulate it back if I were to tell you for instance a, a project not that I have written just like I heard this thing about this one thing and if I can catch your attention I feel like that's a great indicator to me that I should keep going keep pushing on mm. it, keep figuring out what it might be. So I think like how that expresses itself is very kind of format dependent or dependent on kind of the output. You know, if you're trying to make a, a film, if you're trying to make a, a show, if you're just wanting to put out a short video on YouTube and, you know, do it on your own time or whatever, I think how you do it is is kind of format specific. But I think for me, it's, it's always that kind of, am I, curious enough to ask the next question, I think is is where I tend to start. Hmm. What's an example of that that maybe you you knocked on the door and it opened? Like what's so an example of a story that kind of one time? Like that? Yeah, that's great. I mean, so one time, for instance, I uh, I had just moved to New York. Um, so I'm, fr I'm from Texas, but I've been in New York the last five years. I came up here for kind of I, I was making the kind of official transition from DPing to directing. And so coming to New York was was a part of that. And so I think as, you know, anyone who's kind of just hit the city, you end up taking the subway a lot. And it's like, that is the most different thing about living in New York than living anywhere else is just not just public transportation, but the subway in particular. And so there was this one guy who I kept seeing at the 7th Avenue Q st station in Brooklyn and he was he was like a busker. He was playing playing music, and just the way that his voice sounded in the um, subway was just like really compelling. And one day, when I was standing there waiting to get on the train, he started playing a song, like a very obscure song that a friend of mine wrote. Uh, it was a David Ramirez song. Who this is? David is a guy that I've been working on a feature with for a long time. Nobody knows David Ramirez tracks. And he was playing this David song and it was really amazing. So I started filming it on my phone as, but the train showed up. And so as I was kind of backing up into the car uh, of the train, he's playing the song and the doors close. And then I like kept rolling as we started going off. And then I, you know, pulled, swiped the camera down and, but I, I put it on Instagram and I tagged David. I was like, look, like your music's made it to the, you know, subway performers. And somebody messaged me and said, hey, that's my cousin. Like that 
that guy is my cousin. Like I should connect you. And I was like, okay, that's sure. Like that sounds interesting. And so she put me and the subway performer on an email and he was, he, it turns out we lived in the same neighborhood and we met up for coffee. Cause I was like, just, t- you know, tell me about, I'm, I'm curious, like what, how does like subway performing fit into what you do, you know? And how did you know about David's music? And we were talking and da, 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 da. And he said to me, you know, I've been living in New York for 10 years and I've spent more time underground than I have above ground um, because he's, he busks for his entire job. And that statement alone, I was like, all right, can I hang out with you for a day like while you're performing? And he was like, yeah, no problem. So in like 2017, 2018, I spent a, an entire day with him filming and I have no purpose for this. I have no clue. I don't know what I need it for. I don't know where it's going to go. We filmed and and also he, uh, yeah, he's he's just a very kind of like compelling person to watch and so i filmed for a day and then we continue to meet up and like nothing ever really comes from it and then in 2020 when the pandemic hit i reached out to him and just like dude like what are you doing for work because Mm -hmm. your entire job was dependent on commuting and no one's commuting anymore and he was like i don't i don't know what i'm gonna do like uh you know i'm not i'm not really able to work like that anymore and i don't know if i can stay and blah 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 and so a couple months into the pandemic, I asked him to meet up and we met up and I was like, you know, it would be interesting for you and I to go back out to a subway station and you perform to no one. I just think that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Like if we, if you would perform in an empty subway station, uh, maybe we could go to, even we could go up to like, you know, Times Square or, or some like station that should be incredibly busy. And we ended up, he, he was like, all right, let's do it. We met up, got on the subway uh, platform at the station where I'd originally met him. We were going to get on the train to go up to Times Square and, you know, find a busy station that's empty. And there were like hundreds of people on the train when it pulled up. And we were both mm-hmm. like, we hadn't really been out. And we both were incredibly uncomfortable. We realized it was all like hospital workers, like going to hospitals mm-hmm. and going to their jobs and essential workers basically and we were like what the hell are we doing like we can't i'm not getting on the train with them like it just it felt like we can't do this is like we're playing around and like they're going to do serious work right Mm. and so we were like this is let's not do this and so we came back out of the subway station and he was like well why don't we go to prospect park and so we walked out to prospect park and it was like a foggy morning and he was like all right uh, I was like, all right, well, maybe you just set up and play a song like in the middle of Prospect Park. And so he walked out to the middle of Prospect Park, nobody around in the fog. And he sets up and starts playing like he would on the subway station. And all of a sudden, literally out of the mist, this guy goes like Jesse. And he walks up and it was like one of his like regular commuter guys that he hadn't seen, you know, in forever. And the guy was like, oh, my God, like, I haven't seen you. And like, I was wondering how you were doing. And they end up having this moment. And Jesse ends up playing his favorite song for him. And I'm, I filmed the whole thing. And so now I have this like incredible piece of material that's, you know, kind of Jesse performing in a like pre-pandemic normal time. And then I have this like very bizarre kind of like same performance in an empty field that like drew the people that used to listen to him. And like, I still don't know what it is, but like yeah. I've been kicking that around <laughs> for like four years. Right. And now he's wow. left New York. He lives in Nashville. He doesn't do this anymore. And I recorded an interview with him. And I know that's, I'm, I, I hate to like take up like 15 minutes telling one rambling story, but like I have that there are 10 of those happening at any given moment. And I feel mm. like, Part of my process is I don't know if that's going to turn into something like specific. Am I going to make like an actual film out of that? Is it going to be inspiration for something that happens later? Um, Do I just cut the footage together and put it on Instagram or YouTube? I don't really know and I don't really care, but I'm doing that. Like I've been out filming with Yo-Yo Ma. Like I've gone with him three times now. And like, I just have a hard drive of footage of Yo-Yo, like playing in places and meeting these people. And Mm. I don't know what's going to come from that. And like, 
I have these like weird experiments and street films that I make and like all of these. And then there's articles and things coming in. And I feel my obligation is to like continue to pull at these threads to see where they end up going. And I don't Mm. need to rush it. And I'm not scared of like not knowing what this film with Jesse would be. But I feel like as this, like to go back to your really original question, I feel like that is my work is to just continue to like have those experiences and chase those ideas down, whether they come to fruition or not. Mm, there's so much there. I think. <laughs> Sorry, that's first, a lot. No, no, it, it was, it's an amazing story. And I, I think the thing that stands out to me is like the first thing I think of is how you how you um, manage all that in your mind on a day to day basis. If you have 10 of these things going at any point or even more. Yep. One, how are you juggling all of that? Mm-hmm. Are, it sounds like you're just OK with letting it simmer and take whatever yes. time it needs to take, which I'm sure is a learned skill. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure that yep. probably has come with experience. But also, like, how do you when do you know that it's that one is ready for something? When does it click that something is ready to be made into something? Right. I think I mean, I will qualify with I don't exactly know. And this is the focus of the next year, 10 years of my work is, I think, being more intentional about a more rigorous development process. I think that especially in the kind of narrative space um, in film and television in particular, because that stuff just takes a long time, no matter what, even if it's like if people are putting their shoulder into it and you got a team of people, it still takes Mm. years. Right. And so I think that that is really my next focus from a business standpoint is being more intentional with a rigorous development process to make sure that those things are progressing, even if they're in the simmer stage. It's fine. You know, yeah. but I would say I use like synchronicity and overlaps and like uh, people like I, I feel like I'm constantly kind of like throwing things on the wall with people. I'll have a conversation. What do you got going on? Oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing this or like I read something and it's like connected to something else that I've been kind of kicking around and like. I feel like when there's these little like multiplier road signs, I feel like to me, those are like, all right, I should put some more attention into this one. Um, Mm. And then I'll keep going until I like, I feel like there's no, like there's not a natural kind of forward momentum anymore. Like I I just kind of go, all right, I'm going to put that one down for now and then work on the other one. And so um, I know that that sounds pretty ephemeral, but I do, I do feel like, um, I always know which one I should be working on um, just because yeah. it kind of keeps coming up in, in random ways. Right. Kind of uh, haunts you a little bit. Yes. It just kind of sure. follows you a little bit. For sure. Sounds- and, and too, I think um, I often will like, not in a methodical way, but like if you and I were having coffee, I would say like, oh man, I read this thing about the most prolific uh, bank robber in Texas history uh, evaded capture for 30 years and the reason was because it the, the the entire time the fbi was looking for a guy in a cowboy hat uh and it turns out that it wasn't a guy in a cowboy hat it was a woman dressed mm. as a man who was robbing these banks and i'll just say like it was super interesting and then like you and let's say we meet up like three four months later and you're like hey whatever happened to that like uh cowboy bank robber thing like that's super interesting like i i use like it's a good signal. other people's like to see i'll plant things all over the place and then see like what comes back to me <laughs> mm. if that makes sense <laughs> i really like that strategy that's cool yeah. yeah i i i am it's it's funny i think the way my brain works i feel very like i'm very much a person who loves to plan i love having order to things i yeah. love knowing like what I'm walking into every single day. And it sounds yeah. like uh I'm for what you way, do <laughs> you're not that way. <laughs> I'm not great. that way. <laughs> cuz 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 it sounds like yeah, when I when I hear that, I would get very uncomfortable in the um the waiting, I think. I think I'm I've I've like this is like more something I'm trying to work on personally now is like being patient with things and not forcing stuff as as mm-hmm. much. But that sounds like something you're naturally 
pretty okay with is like, I don't need to force work or force this film or force things like maybe until, you know, it's the thing you need to be right. working on, you know, but it sounds like you're okay with that waiting. I'm okay with the waiting for sure. I will qualify though that like, you know, I direct commercials is my day job, right? Mm. I don't wait around right. on that. Like right. I have multiple meetings like a month. If I'm not getting boards, like I'm on like the, you know, my, my managers and agents uh, essentially. Yeah. And not just that, but once I do a pro, like once I pitch on a project, which is a two to three week full court press, yeah. like that's what I'm mostly doing. If I then win the job, it turns into two ish months of like nine to five, well, right. <laughs> nine to nine, like right. intensity on that project. I know exactly what I'm doing. I get a, like my producers send me like a daily calendar. This is what you need to do today. You know, I need this, this, and this from you. Like, and I, so I bring that up to say that like, there is that kind of very intentional structured side of my life and my work, um, mm. which is necessary. And I do appreciate if I only did it like that, though, I would like, I would crumble. I, can, I just right. I, like, I would run out of everything. So a lot of times I'll do this like very intense structured experience on a commercial. And then the backside of it is like two months of wandering around poking at things right, right? um yeah. and and trusting then that like i may have to put that down because i'm got now i've got to like go pay the rent yep. you know doing this project and i trust that the things i was poking around on are going to inform how i do my day job and like my day job gives me an amazing amount of like structured time to not think like i'm forced to not work on the subway dock because i can't i don't have time right. And so it it is a it is a helpful rhythm. I feel like that this is a rhythm that has developed in a positive way. I think for me is that kind of planting and harvesting, you know, kind of rhythm. Yeah. I feel I feel like um, has been an intentional thing over. Mm -hmm. If I were just floating around like poking stuff, I would like run out of money and not uh, <laughs> right. eat, yeah. you know, and like right. and nothing yeah. would get done. So I can't right. only do that. <laughs> sure, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up. I know that you're still you're still self-employed. You're still on your own. Am, yeah. But but this is this is an interesting thing that I've been I've been interacting actually with a lot of friends lately who there is this weird freedom in having like a quote unquote day job and then yeah. not and then having your creative endeavor be something that you don't need money from. Yes. And I think that there, you know, I it might just be an R this generation of like you need to do what you love for your job mentality. But in, you know, and a lot of us, like I've been there, done that in the past mm -hmm. where I was just freelance. I was the meanderer w wandering yep. around with zero yep. structure. And that was like arguably the worst time of my life is yep, just having like sure. this total freedom. Yep. And it was very interesting because it's what I thought I wanted forever. And then once, once you're there, it's actually really difficult and really hard. And I think a lot of creators who I know have hit the same wall where it's like, it's not what you expect to just do yeah. whatever you want all day, every day. And I think it's interesting that you're, you, even you, you have a couple months where you get to do whatever you want, but then you have a couple yeah. months where you're very structured and yeah. that balance is really healthy. But you, you've, you've yeah. found that, that that balance really helps you stay in a good it spot. It does. And I mean, I say this to people all the time. Like I, I just, I don't like, like a day job is not a pejorative like phrase to me um right it, it, not in the slightest because even if you are the freest person in the world like mm. i mean i say this all the time like I, I know it because i pitch against them the biggest most famous movie directors that you know that you are just like surely wes anderson mm -hmm. doesn't like have to do like stupid stuff he can just work on his movies absolutely not the guy directs yeah. commercials on a regular basis to pay his bills mm. like there there is no such thing as like total freedom everyone has to pay the rent somehow and they will i mean the the number of people who only work on their own projects i mean probably have a trust fund um right. and like that's <laughs> right. a different that's a different like i'm sure there's different set of struggles that come with that i don't know what they are but i feel like right. you know for those of us who like actually have to pay the rent 
a day job, like it doesn't matter how it ends up shaking down, like that will be part of our lives. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, and not just that, but I feel like there's a lot of freedom that comes from keeping that work in the proper context. Right. Yeah. So for me, when I go do commercials, for instance, like, I love the process of doing commercials. I I say it all the time. It's like getting to work out with an extremely expensive personal trainer, right? Mm. Where like I, there's something I want to get better at as a filmmaker and I will go, I set the intention before every job. This is what I want to work on this time. Like, I feel like sometimes when I get asked a question from, you know, an agency creative or something, when they start talking about wardrobe. I don't really have great answers, right? I don't, mm. I, I'm very dependent on my stylist to like make these choices. All right, so on this next one, I wanna find a wardrobe stylist who's very collaborative, who's open to like explaining their thought process to me so that like, I, and I wanna make several very specific choices that I have to back up on this project. That's my, yeah. like, that's the entire goal of this commercial is for me to like walk away having a better grasp of, how to be a good leader, decision maker, and creative like person when it comes to wardrobe. And yeah. then the next one, I'll, I may say, I, I want to shoot like, I want to find a way I am uncomfortable shooting like on a dolly. And I want to integrate dolly work into this next commercial mm. um, because I need to like, that will make me a better filmmaker. And so I, I find that a day job, if you kind of keep it in the proper focus can honestly unlock an enormous amount of growth and potential in your other endeavors right right i yeah i think like yeah getting away from a day I, it's just i it's some that pejorative nature of how people describe day, day jobs like a big pet peeve of mine yeah. um, because it it just it can be really amazing and it also can become a crutch and then you need to leave it right, right. like it can also be the Golden thing that like a hundred percent where you're like, you're scared to try anything that's not, you know, at a certain level or, you know, whatever it may be. Like at some point you're going to have to say no to it um, as well. But I think that like, you'll know when that time comes, but in and of itself, like I think interacting and engaging with a day job is a, is a critical skill to have as, as a, you know, a creative person in 2022. For sure. I think that the, that perspective is huge. And I think that's kind of, you know, opened me up over time is like, how can I use, you know, use this job or client work or whatever it is that I don't have total ownership over as a, as a teacher to your yes. point. It's like, what can I learn from this? And what can I get paid to learn from this? Yes. Literally, <laughs> like, like you're sure. getting paid to learn stuff on the job. And I think that that perspective can shift so much. It even makes a day job more fun, more fulfilling. If you're like, your perspective isn't like, oh, I'm just dragging through this yep. shitty day job or whatever it's right. it, but it's more like with purpose for something that you actually sure. care about for i'm sure. curious for you like how how do you now you know you've been doing this for a long time uh mm -hmm. you've been doing this for what over a decade at this point yeah yeah, yeah i start i got into filmmaking in 2011 okay yep. how do you look back on your past work now how do you how do you do that <laughs> um I don't have an extremely healthy uh, relationship with my previous work. Um, I tend to, I mean, I'm, I'm not abnormal in, in the sense that like I will always be hardest on my sure. own work. You know, yeah. everyone else sees it differently than I do. But no, I mean, I think, I think for me, I look back at like more than like any specific project i feel like i look back at tentpole moments you know like uh, that project i really like it represents when the previous say 12 to 18 months of work kind of really came together right mm -hmm. and like that one really felt great and then there's a bunch of like okay that, yeah yeah nothing extremely memorable and then there'll be another one like a year later or two years later that like you just kind of go like, all right, that that was a great representation of like all the stuff that was kind of that I was working on over those couple of years, like came together on that one. That one felt like I was like it was a good opportunity. And I met I kind of rose to the challenge of that particular project, whatever mm. it may be. And so I feel like I'm able, at least if not from a creative standpoint, 
from a like kind of holistic like career standpoint i feel like i can look back with fondness at certain projects as a representation of of like i had i had intentionally grown you know like put steps in to get better and like it came together on that project and then yeah. you know then i moved forward so i think for me it's it's really about looking at those kind of tentpole projects that represent like chunks of growth if that makes sure. sense yeah you said you're you're hard on yourself just like anybody is it is it because mm -hmm. like for me i just cringe when i look back on oh, yeah. old old music or old things i made like did that is like looking at these tentpole moments that's a very healthy perspective i'm sure that takes work and effort though if you go back it and does. see things. yeah yeah it does i mean i think but i but part of it is like in my like um you know in the work that i do now i'm so i'm signed at a production company how it works in commercials is essentially you sign a multi-year contract with a production company and they essentially act as your manager so all of your commercial work will end up going through the this particular production company and then that production company has what's called directors reps in different markets so they'll have an east mm. coast rep a west coast rep a you know a midwest rep and so they're like your agents. So you have agents and then you have your manager that you work kind of closely with about, should I take this job? What, what do we want to do 18 months from now? Blah, 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 blah. And mm -hmm. then the, the, the director's reps are the kind of the ones where the boards are coming, like where the jobs are actually coming. Like, oh, there's a, you know, a Budweiser Super Bowl job that's in for Ryan. Like, you know, do you want to pitch on it? And so that, that is like, because of those relationships and they're constantly needing to present work to people, there is a necessity to look back on previous work. Like I, I can't just like go, I right. like everything I've done before is like, doesn't exist, you know? Mm. And so I've had to get better at like looking back on previous work and not just looking back on previous work, but knowing for a fact that like that previous work is being bundled and presented to like an agency to get, future work so like i right. can't even like i have to have some kind of healthy relationship with it because it is speaking for my right. like future opportunities and so anyway yeah i've had to learn how to do that for sure i think for me like what it like staying in touch with your past work what has been helpful for me is i can see when i was swayed by some kind of stylistic uh broader kind of like cultural mm. stylistic moment right yeah. and the stuff that i li i like <laughs> the stuff i can tolerate is typically the stuff that like does not feel incredibly time stamped what's so, an example of that like what's what uh, what stands out is like something that was very trendy that might not fit today oh uh, i mean like today if you like i mean three years ago two years ago i think in the commercial space like this mixed media like filming approach so you would like you'd roll 16 mil and digital and super uh -huh. eight and like and vhs and like you just like yeah. you'd make up for like having no story by just like frenetically <laughs> intercutting like all kinds right. of crazy shit and like i did a couple of those for sure uh okay. but, like i did one for adidas so like and they were like a huge kind of uh they just they went all in on on like mixed media stuff. And so it will feel 100% timestamped. Like that right. work will feel timestamped. Whereas I did another project. I did a project for Nike where we shot 16 and digital. But I basically shot digital so that they wouldn't freak out about us shooting 16. And so even though the spot is technically cutting back and forth between digital and 16, it doesn't feel like a mixed media piece. What mm. it feels like is I was able to create like a cover, like a, a comfort level in the client with the digital. And then my 16 mil operator is an amazing DP um, named Matt Ballard was able to just go like buck wild with the 16. Yeah. And it's still some of the coolest like 16 stuff that I've gotten to do. And so that one, that one still not only does it not feel timestamp, but like that one still gets me jobs. And that was like five years mm, ago. That's so cool. I love yeah. that. I, and it's probably like a good way to think about work too. And I think most people probably fall into it as like your stylistic choices, things like that. I think there's, there's lots to be said that's good about like, you know, 
capitalizing on trends and what's cool For right sure. now and things like that. But I also think kind of always laying the foundation of timelessness in your work and yeah. like letting that always be there kind of hovering. It's like, okay, that needs to be the foundation of what you work on. It just gives you so much longevity. For sure. Well, and otherwise you just have to be, you have to be like, uh, you have to essentially, if you want to kind of be trendy and I don't mean that in a negative way, it's, it's more like, it's like fashion. You just better be like a little Ready. bit early. Right. right. And that, and that's, you need to commit to being like on, right. like on trend slightly early, but not so early that everyone's like, what the hell is like, what is, right. what are you doing? Yeah. I have two friends of mine who are the most purely talented people I've ever met. I don't know. I don't know how they make a living. I don't know what they do. Like they're just <laughs> creative people. They're, they're designers, I guess, but I just yeah. don't know how they end up like getting in projects and like they are. <laughs> routinely presenting stuff to me that i'm just like ah uh, i mean i don't know that yeah. seems crazy and then like three years later it's what everything cool. looks like what they were making yeah. they're but they're like they're too early because right. the you know i'm never early i'm like slightly on the back side of the bell curve yeah and so if i think it's cool then like it's already happening right yep. it's definitely already happening <laughs> and so yeah. These guys, like if they can't even get the people who are a little early, like you want to be on the front side of that bell curve, but not like, you know, just over the peak a little bit early. Those are the people who like you can make a whole career just being at that spot. But it, you, your work, then your art mm. form is staying on at that point on the curve, riding that wave. And I just have no tolerance for that. I'm not I'm never early enough. Right. Basically. That's a great so, take. Yeah. In those in those moments, I feel uh, I just turned thirty. But in those moments, I feel very <laughs> I feel very old because I'm just like, dang! Like I remember when, uh, when like the the Matrix glasses started getting cool again, like these little tiny, and it just like <laughs> these style yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, whoa! I am no longer the target demo of what is cool in society at all. <laughs> like this is I'm way I'm way too old for all this stuff. Um, <laughs> For so. sure. Hey everyone, we'll be right back with the episode, but really quick, I have to tell you about Riverside, the leading podcast and video platform in the world. And truthfully, we love Riverside and we used it way before we even talked to them about becoming a sponsor for literally every episode of Make Something Cool. We cannot do what we do without it. And the reason we love it so much is it's a lot like Zoom, but I can record much higher quality audio and video on their platform. And what's amazing is it doesn't matter where the guest is located. It sounds like we're sitting in the room together while we're recording. It's amazing. And so right after you're done recording, you download separate audio and video tracks from the Riverside platform, and you can easily edit your content from within the online platform if you want. It's so easy. It's seamless. We use it all the time. Josh, my producer, he's in Riverside editing, gathering files, and it makes all of our process so seamless and easy every single week. And we're not the only ones who love Riverside. There are over 70,000 people ranging from individual creators to the big, big podcasts like Guy Raz, Gary V, Spotify, the New York Times. And the reason why so many people are switching to Riverside is because it's really, really good and easy and simple to use. So please go check them out today. You can hit the link in the description of the show notes, or you can just head over to riverside.fm, create an account and get started today. Okay, back to the episode. Yeah, I'm curious, like, I mean, you've been doing it since 2011. I think more broadly, I'm curious, like, for you, what's maybe one of the bigger lessons or, you know, you had mentioned tent poles in your work, but maybe like yeah. tent pole lessons for you that you've learned about being a full time creator in that in that time? Like, what's kept you going? What's kept you motivated? What have you learned there? Um, Like a couple things come to mind when you say that I'm all pick at it a little bit this is not directly answering your question but i think there's a couple of things that that i've kind of continued to keep because so i didn't i didn't start in filmmaking i started in audio so i did audio i was an audio engineer before getting into filmmaking so 2011 mm. i was an audio engineer and i entered a short film contest that ended up like winning and then going to sundance so that's how mm. i got into films it was an, an abrupt change from audio into film 
And so before that, I had been in Nashville, like, you know, as a second engineer on like Kings of Leon records and like, mm. you know, doing the kind of, uh, I, I joke around all the time that I paid my dues in the wrong industry. Um, right. So I basically had a very kind of grunt level experience of working in music. And I had an early mentor in music tell me, like, if you don't, if you can get comfortable not knowing what you're going to be doing like four to six weeks from now, like, you'll be fine. Like, mm. that's it. If you can be okay, like not knowing what you're doing six weeks from now, then like you'll be fine for your entire career. And I feel like that has continued to be true, even if I'm like working on a project that I know what I'm doing for the next <laughs> four to six weeks. I don't know what I'm doing after. And that's fine. Like, I'm totally I'm comfortable with that. And I've been doing that. I've had that experience for 15 years now, just kind of like not was that. Was that natural or was that learned? Yeah. Okay. You're no, just been fine. I think it I think it what what was natural was me being okay about it. What was also natural was then freaking out about it. Like and kind of rapidly yeah. oscillating back and forth between those. <laughs> sure. And I think the yeah. like the having to trust that something will always materialize um mm. at some point. Um I still have to like talk myself off the ledge sometimes, you know. Mm. And in fact, a lot of times when it kind of you're in a down cycle where it's it's a little quiet. I have to convince myself not to spin up a bunch of stuff because a lot of times you'll do that. And then all of a sudden, like, sure enough, the board came in for the project or the whatever came in. And then all of a sudden I've got this other stuff I've spun up. Right. And now I've got a I've got the opposite problem where I've like overcommitted, which can be really bad for your career in the long term. Right. Overcommitting. You don't want to be an overcommitter. And so yeah, it's, I, I still have to learn how to like ride that wave of going like, OK, I don't exactly know what's going to happen, but I'm OK. It's going to like trust the process. It's going to be OK. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's so that that's one for sure. And then the other thing is I when I was kind of floating around in my 20s, I was doing audio and I loved photography and I ended up applying for this photo workshop with a very famous photojournalist. And I went and did this like two week thing in Cambodia. And I was taking pictures and I just felt like, man, nothing I'm shooting looks like anything else anyone's shooting. We would like go shoot all day and all night if we wanted. And then during the kind of middle of the day when the light was bad, this journalist would help us edit our our work mm -hmm. down into like one photo essay was the point of the, the workshop. Cool. And I remember him at the end of the workshop saying, like, I'm when I look at all the photographs of everybody from this workshop, Yours is the only one that I can just like, I know we're like Ryan shot that one, that one and that one. And he was like, I don't know how that happened. I don't know, you know, what happened in your life that you have such a clear like visual identity, but like you have to protect that for the rest of your career. Like, wow, you, yeah. you, you have to protect like if someone can't identify that you made it without seeing your name attached to it, like, what are you doing basically? Right. So I feel like those two things have been like amorphously like in the back of my head. Don't freak out about not knowing what's happening in the next couple of months. And are the things I'm making identifiable as me, even if nobody knew I was involved? Yeah, this will probably sound like blowing smoke up your ass. And I don't mean it that way. But I actually have a story about that with you <laughs> where where so I'm I'm like a I love ford broncos like the old ones mm, mm -hmm. and i remember when i first saw the ford bronco commercial i was like yeah. either ryan booth or solomon ligthelm made this as i'm watching yep. it, i'm like there's a very clear style and turns out you both did it both <laughs> of us did exactly but, right but I, but I was like one of those two guys made it and that was yeah. that that's like kind of pointing directly to what you're saying is like, yeah, I had no clue. I just thought it was yeah. a badass commercial and the car looked freaking cool. And I was like, yeah, but I think there's something else here where I had seen this work in the past and I knew one of you, either of you had done it because it had both these flavors of you both. And I was yes. like, one of them yep. definitely did. And it was crazy. That's, that's yep. such a testament to what, what that photojournalist had taught you just like maintaining yes. that voice, that creative yep. voice that you have. Yeah, I mean, he went so far as to say, because I was thinking photography at the time. He he went so far as to say, like, don't go to, don't go back to school, don't go work for anybody, 
Like wow. basically don't put yourself in a position where they're going to try and chip that away. Right. Um, to like that, that you're at a kind of critical point in your life in which you will, you would potentially a- assume someone else's like wow. visual identity. Uh, so don't do that. Like go wander in the wilderness uh, and just like survive. And if you can like make it the next few years, like that will solidify and then, no one could ever take it away from you because it'll be kind of grafted onto your approach. Wow. Um, which has turned out to be pretty true. I do like, I love, I love getting texts from people like saying like, Hey, did you work on blah, blah, blah. And like most of the time they're right. Mm-hmm. Like most of the time. Yeah, I did. I did work on that actually. Yeah. Which is cool. That advice That's is very so, cool. so counterintuitive though, to be like, Hey, don't go to school. Don't get a mentor. Don't, don't <laughs> like, like, but I personally totally. love it. Like I resonate with that so much. I've always been like, you, 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 and not. I don't want to get. I'm gonna try and avoid getting political. But no matter where you go to learn things, you are being, you are being taught things that will eventually be grafted onto you. To your point mm-hmm. of who mm-hmm. you are, and I think a lot of times we do ourselves a disservice by, you know, people who shouldn't go to college end up going to college, yeah. Yeah. and they get grafted with some story about who they should or shouldn't become from this institution that truthfully doesn't know or care that much about where their story should lead and the opposite's also right. true people don't go to college because they have some other st- you know and i think like that idea of really following like trusting yourself i think ultimately yeah. that's what they were telling you to do is like trust for sure what you have and chase it down it's not going to be perfect for a while but chase it down yeah. and trust it and that's like for sure pretty rare advice right now i at least to me i don't hear that very often No, for sure. I mean, and, and I think that like, and I think also was great advice for me, you know, where I, where I happen to be. Cause I think I was in the, like, I don't know what I want to do. Can somebody tell me what I should do? Kind of, I was in that mode. And I think that he, uh, it's a photographer named Gary Knight. I think he was very, very intuitively understood that I was at a point where I just like, I'll do anything if you tell me I should do it. And he was like, dude, the thing you need is to have a visual identity if you want to work and you already have that. So if you're looking for someone to define that for you, like that is the wrong thing to be looking at, you know? Whereas I think there's other people who like very well could use to like, you know, get, get kind of put into a larger, I I think of a friend of mine named Josh Goldman, who's like an amazing filmmaker, an amazing photographer and he ended up working for Danny Clinch, who's a very famous kind of music photographer um, and filmmaker and like worked for Danny for like 10 or 12 years. And for sure, like a lot of Josh's like the mechanical approach of like his work is very informed by Danny's. Mm. He's for sure like in Danny's legacy now. And yet he still has his own like spin on the material and I feel like has built an amazing career for himself. And in fact, in my 20s, like when I knew Josh, you know, when we were just kind of both getting going and like I was incredibly jealous of like the fact that, you know, as Danny's assistant, he's working with, you know, all the people I can only hope to work with one day, Mm. you know, and at some point he's able to like pick up the jobs that Danny doesn't want to do, you know, like, hey, just Josh can do it. And like, so he built an amazing reel and resume by being kind of downstream of Danny, but he as a person like as a creative person was able to kind of maintain his own identity within that even while kind of like being adjacently connected to Danny I don't think I could have done that I think I would have just like copied and pasted Mm -hmm. like everything I saw from someone else and at some point down the down the road would have had my midlife crisis of going like I don't have anything to say you know and so I feel like that advice is is definitely i mean one of my favorite <laughs> i say it all the time it's like all advice is autobiographical uh right. <laughs> and i i feel like that that particular expression was the right was the right move for me even as even though it felt like it took an extra 10 years i do feel very confident in what i how i see the world which i'm i'm very thankful for even if i wouldn't have minded you know it happening faster <laughs> sure <laughs> you know yeah, yeah i think that yeah that's really good it, it makes me think of what's that term survivorship bias hmm. where it's yeah. like where you know you can hear about the classic 
whoever the hell people are inspired by these. If it's like an Elon Musk, it's like the Elon right. Musk success story. There's a lot of survivorship bias and in, in whatever he will, whatever advice he'll give you. So much of yep. it's luck. So much of it is circumstance. So much of it is setting. Sure. So much of it is chance. And so you can't like copy and paste Elon Musk's Mm-mm. story to yours and expect anything good to happen. There's, and I think yeah. uh, you can learn things. You can be inspired, of course. Like that's obvious. But I think to your point, like there's a lot of survivorship bias and just blindly taking someone else's path or advice for whatever you're trying to do in your work. It's, that's a bad plan. I think you have to carve. Yeah your own way eventually i'm well okay. and I, I think what what like always stands out to me and other people's stories is is typically the moments in which they're like oh shit i didn't know what to do because mm-hmm. i feel like the kind of you know and this i mean it goes a little bit into social media and all of that stuff but i do think that like the kind of the pressure to present like a linear kind of path you know is is very strong and i feel like hearing other people's stories, I tend to connect most when people are like, yeah, I like I ran full speed into the brick wall on that one, you yeah. know, just because I feel like that's that is actually the moment when you you typically make like life altering in a positive way, like life altering decisions after you've hit the brick wall. And I feel like, um, yeah, that's that's what I tend to take from people's like, oh, yeah, I, then I worked for this person or I did this or I won that or whatever. I'm like, I mean, cool. I won't be able totally. to. That won't happen for me. Right. You know, so very unrelatable. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm curious. You, we before we hit record, you you had mentioned you have a family, you have kids. I do. And, yeah. and I know it's kind of weird, like disproportionately a large number of my like best friends in the world are DPs. And they mm. they live in the world of uh, film and commercial film for whatever reason. I've made yep. friends with a lot of camera guys for whatever mm-hmm. reason. But what I've learned from them and kind of observing their life, it's tough. Like the in, really the, tough. the industry, the film industry, but the commercial film industry, like the whole thing is it's really I don't think people fully understand how grueling the world is. And I'm curious how for you, you've been able to manage that while having a family trying to have any sort of balance because like you had mentioned it a little bit earlier like the nine to nine for six weeks straight yeah, lifestyle yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like you're not exaggerating like i know that it's no. that intense that like and yeah. pretty frequently too and there's a lot of travel and stuff like that like how have you managed that i mean that's a great question it's definitely something i wish people talked about more and some people's answer is i don't have a family and i don't think i ever really want one um, mm-hmm. because the the work is like it is all consuming if you even if you're attempting for it to not be it it very easily kind of switches into this kind of all consuming mm-hmm. nature and so i think a couple of things one i have a partner that i'm very like that you know we've been together for a long time and we have to communicate constantly what worked last year may not work this year i have two kids two girls and like they're getting older now and so like what used to work doesn't work and what used to not work like works fine now Mm -hmm. like and so everything just can is constantly evolving and changing in in terms of what your family dynamic is what things like work and don't work and and i think too like how how disruptive like my one you know i'm i'm one of four so like how disruptive my one life becomes for everyone, right. I think is, is, you know, constantly evolving. So um, if I'm totally honest, part of the reason I made the move from DPing to directing was family related. I was a very good DP, but I was at the moment in my career, which I could, it was either going to switch gears. It was switching gears. It was actively like about to take off in a very kind of serious way. And I, I wanted to direct as well, but I think I, I would have taken longer to make the move over to directing. I may have gone as a bit higher DPing and then jumped over to directing, but I made the move just because I saw the future and the future was getting called later and later, like closer and closer to shoot time and my shoots getting bigger and bigger. So like, you know, it used to be like I'd be gone for three days to go shoot this thing. And then it was turning into like, I'm getting called today 
to leave tomorrow for three weeks. Mm. That doesn't work, right? right? And so, um, so that was partly the move because as a director, it's still crazy. But I like, you know, I mean, I I pitched on something in December that would have been me tra- would have meant traveling at the end of February, right? Mm. So like, that's at least a, enough time to like make a plan. Sure, know if I'm getting it. You know, it's not like I get a call today and I leave tomorrow, right? Well, um, and you would be and the so, one making that call now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So you get to kind of well, they present a schedule to me, okay. so it's still I'm still a bit on, like when I get a brief, it's like here's how many days we want to shoot, and this is the week that we want to shoot it. Right. Um, and so typically there's a little bit of uh, there's typically there's a little bit of uh, give, but not much. But anyway, I you know I think as well like when I travel, I travel like two, three, four weeks at a time. Hmm as a director, which is a lot on a family, a lot on a partner. But, you know, as the jobs get bigger, the thing that is now true is like, I did a job in October was the last time I traveled for a job. Gotcha. Um, But it was a huge, I was gone for, I mean, it was a, it was a 12 week job. I was gone for four weeks basically, but I've been home since. Gotcha. Um, And so that I I think actually the like being gone for two or three days and then back for two or three days and then gone again and then back and then gone was actually more disruptive than now, which is home for a couple months, gone for a month, home for a few months, gone for a month. Right. So anyway, but it's uh, the I, that's that's just the mechanics of my kind of story. I think it's something that I'm always asking this question to guys who are older than me. I'm just like, how do you do this? Honestly, it's it's partly been the reason that I've been okay like letting the the film the move into film and tv has been taking a little bit longer partially because i've just i I feel like it'll be more successful for me and my family when my family when my kids are older when i make that move because you know not like they're giving me the star wars movie to shoot but like that's a like you go to you like have to move somewhere else for two years right you know um and like that doesn't work for my family right now so i think you know, everything's a bit contained with commercials, which is, which works at the moment. Yeah. Is that the vision though? Sorry, that was a rambly, a rambly answer to your question, but it's, it is definitely, I think communication with your partners like is key. And then I think, you know, just being very open with the people that are around you and and helping you on projects about what you can and can't do and and what does and doesn't work, I think is, is quite important. Yeah. No, that, that, makes sense and i yeah i think it's it's weird because i've i i have friends kind of who span the whole you know i have friends who are not married or don't have a a partner or don't have any they're just kind of doing the solo thing and they're just totally bought in to like the career path yeah totally but then there's the there's the other extreme you know closer to what you have where it's like a family dynamic and all that stuff and it seems like there's like this level of paying dues for a while to where you can like earn that time yes but it's it just seems very very daunting and difficult it is i mean it's no joke man it it definitely is like i I won't sugarcoat it it's it's i mean and there's stuff that i've turned down just because like doesn't work like just doesn't work for like you know it's the first day of school and my kids like been really freaking out about it and like me being gone will disrupt everything and like i'm sorry i can't like i can't do that job unless you can move it and if you can't move it then i can't do the job And I do, I have had to say no to stuff before, but typically I feel like creativity, work, projects, it fills whatever barrier, like whatever container you allow for, Mm. you know, and I, I have been continually surprised that if you just put up a barrier that says I can do this and I can do that, but I'm not going to do this, Mm. that like it, it all works out. It ends up working out. I think feeling the hardest thing to do is to say no mm. um but i think it's actually one of the most important things to learn right. as a as a creative um because you find that like you aren't uh y- you're not as kind of you know dependent on the whims of other people as you feel like you have to be you know and dps have it dps have a tough time because you know when when it's interesting, like the experience of a commercial or a film project, they're so hard to get going mm. that like, like there's all this time and I'm experiencing it when it's kind of like still a bit mushy gushy and like, I don't know exactly how this is all going to shape up. Mm-hmm. And then it starts to kind of like, 
swirl and get tighter and then like it feels like the water is starting to go right mm-hmm. and like you're getting closer to the waterfall and then all of a sudden the current picks you and like things are just happening right you know like it is just it is moving like you can't stop it if you wanted to right and not only that but like if you got thrown out the whole thing would keep going right. and yeah. it's in that moment that the dp gets a call do you want in? We're going now. <laughs> yeah. Like, come on, like get in the boat. If you're getting in the boat, right. the waterfall's right over there, you know, like, yeah. and so I know that the pressure, there's this artificial pressure for DPs in particular, because like, dude, it is happening. Literally, if you, if the answer is no, like click, p- call the next DP. I have 150 like, we need people you. right like, behind Get you. in the boat, yeah. you know, click, right. get in the boat. And so, whereas as the director, like I get to be earlier in the process and like, can be involved in shaping how it's coming together, what the process of filming is going to be, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So DP is like my hats off to him. It is a tough, you were just getting like shot out of a cannon yeah. so many times when you say yes to a project. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I have two more questions for you. Yes. What do you feel like is the challenge that you find yourself battling the most with your creative work that you have to overcome often? I think the, Fear of having to stand like I think for me, I want to make work that is sig- significant. And what I mean by significant is work that outlasts the current moment and connects with a wide range of people. To do that, you typically need to be quite talented and skilled at crafting something. But at its core, you need to be vulnerable and willing to say something before you know how people are going to respond to it. And that fear, I feel like, is the the like the work I have to put in to overcome, which is for me to say something significant, to put a piece of work out that is meaningful, will require me to present myself without knowing how people will respond to it. And that, especially when you think that the projects I want to be a part of might take multiple years to come together like that is a terrifying prospect to spend years doing something to put it out and it not resonate or not know how people are going to react to it i feel like that fear is kind of always churning in the back of my head Mm -hmm. you know as i'm looking at the next five to ten years of my of my career in which i'm going to start putting out work that is not just my work for hire stuff right you know where it's like because all the work for hire stuff, it's easy to at some point just go like, well, you know, I don't know. The idea wasn't great or the client screwed it up or, <laughs> you know, if the agency had listened to me, you know, whatever. There's always an excuse um, right. with work for hire stuff. But like when it's my own project, there's nothing to hide behind. Right. Um, and I'm nervous about that transition. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it's like taking total ownership over something is scary. And also, I think it's scary to be. You know, like the vulnerability, that's what connects a good story. Like that's what people watch sure. watch stories for. 100%. But it takes a, a huge amount of bravery to summon, to be able to say that first before anyone else. Yeah. To be the first one to yep. raise your hand and speak up. Yes. That's really a terrifying notion. And I think to your point, you know, that, you know, I've, my background's in like the tech media world. And so it's like, yeah, I'm you know, we, we have like these very instant feedback loops of like, oh, yep, we're testing this, that worked or that didn't work. And it's just like very low yep. stakes testing. But for what you're describing, yep. it's it's very high stakes because it's a lot of money. Yeah. Years. Yep. And you're you're years. you're yep. putting, you know, your ass on the line a little bit, basically putting yep. yourself out there in a way that no one else is. It's just like a vulnerability that not no one else is willing to take. And that's why it's important that you do or a filmmaker or creator does and that's what makes it valuable that's what makes it you know that's what makes something sharp to cut through the noise of everything else going on is that vulnerability yep but that's a hard step to take yeah it's terrifying yeah (laughs) (laughs) um and and like it's like cyclically terrifying so like even if you do it once well Mm -hmm. like it starts all over again right the next the next one is like you just might as well start it completely over of that that kind of like do i really have anything to say is this worth pursuing is this like you know how does this intersect with like blah 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 i mean i got i got to work on a documentary about the making of the revenant which was really amazing to like 
sit with Alejandro and 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 the director of that that documentary was a guy named Elliot Rausch, who's like a very kind of spiritual filmmaker as well. And Alejandro, I mean, we were sitting with him like cameras cut. We're just sitting there and he literally was like, guys, I still don't know what the movie's about. And the movie's like it's like done edited. (laughs) Right. It's cut. Yeah, Yeah, it's done. I I like I guarantee you like and he basically was like, I I may never know like what the movie was about, you know, like why I felt so compelled to do it i'm like dude you've spent so much of your life yeah. like working on this one film and not just that but like people have reacted to it people you know like it's mm. it's out in the world and he's still like wrestling with like what it all means right. you know and i found that to be both terrifying but also like oddly comforting for sure that like you know somebody working literally at the pinnacle of like my chosen art form is like yeah, i don't know i have no idea but yeah. like i felt compelled and so i went for it that's a crazy story <laughs> oh, dude, that's bananas yeah. <laughs> i, I yeah. to be honest i still don't remember what that movie was about i loved it but it was it was uh yeah, yeah. it was uh yeah it was it was an interesting i just you weren't were you there like shoot shooting in the cold we went uh no we, they when we were on set with them they had like an onset like person filming like the entire production oh, cool. so a lot of the footage is from that that particular filmmaker but we went out they were doing a bunch of pickups in los angeles like out in the woods um cool. and so we i was on set for that bit which was really cool we actually filmed the opening sequence of that movie is like a village is burned to the ground and like leo's wife dies mm-hmm. or whatever that actually was added after they'd already wrapped wow. um principal photography and they had gotten a cut of the film and basically the kind of general consensus was that people just weren't quite connecting with the journey because they didn't know that backstory Mm -hmm. and so they added that in basically after editing the film together to just to like create kind of a an emotional impetus for this relationship between you know the son and and leo forest and and leo but they were having, they were chasing the snow. So they were down in Argentina, like shooting stuff. And the production designer uh, is a guy named Jack Hitt, who's like legendary production designer, multiple Oscars, worked for everybody. Really amazing guy. He built this entire village. It took him four months to build the village and they burned it down in a day. And not only that, they were down in Argentina shooting, you know, snow, the kind of epic fight between Tom Hardy and, and Leonardo. So Alejandro never saw the village in person until the day before. And so I was with Jack after Alejandro had seen it and they'd made their plan. And like I was with Jack, the kind of basically that it was late in the afternoon and we were filming him and he basically walked through his entire village. And I'm telling you, this is like you like you could live there. Mm. It was amazing. It was just like the detail work and like, I mean, it was an incredible incredible set and like you will never see 90 percent of the work you know that he put into it and he basically was walking around like saying goodbye to this set that he just spent five months of his life building that was going to be burned to the ground and you know the next day and he just like at one point he was just like sitting in the middle of this like this house Mm -hmm. hut thing that he had built and like just like letting it happen just sitting there Mm. you know and i was like what are you thinking about you know and he was like i'm just thankful for my work thankful that i got to put myself into like this place um and that my team was able to do that and that we were able to work so hard to like bring this to life in a way that it will feel real no matter if people see much of it or not Mm. you know and it was like bro that's inspiring (laughs) like is incredible so i feel like that i bring that story up because i feel like i carry that with me of going like he like you have to put that much of yourself into the work Mm. like whether people see it or not connect with it or not whether it gets burned down tomorrow i think that 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 level of intensity of vulnerability of attention to detail like it all kind of translates in a really amazing dare i say spiritual way that you just like you just feel it um and 
I think the people that execute at the highest level are people who are inextric- inextricably tied to their work, mm. right? They're just, it's in the DNA of what they put out. And so that's what I want to do. It just can be pretty terrifying from time sure. to time. I love that story. It's a great story. Yeah. I mean, my last question is kind of the inverse of the last is what's the most rewarding part about what you do? I think the most rewarding part of what I do is that I get to spend time walking in someone else's shoes on a regular basis, Mm -hmm. whether that be characters or, you know, a documentary experience where I get to literally meet somebody that I would never meet in my normal life. I think it has been like filmmaking for me has been a passport to see people and meet people and hear stories and experience the world in a more kind of holistic and broad way, way outside of my social circles, my history, my like upbringing. I've gotten to go travel far and wide beyond anything that I like knew as kind of normal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been incredibly enriching in my life. I mean, my, the people that I have met and spent not just met but spent time with and worked closely with are some really really fascinating and Mm. and amazing people that like i would never have met without this profession and so i think that you know i i one of my favorite descriptions of filmmaking is that it's that they're empathy machines Mm. and i feel like as a person i get to experience that directly Mm. you know i get to go to these places and meet these people and and sit in people's homes and spend very, very intense amounts of time with people and I'm, I'm all the better for it for sure. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, I lied. I do have one more question. And, and that, yeah. that is just thinking about broadly speaking, if you were talking to Ryan 15 years ago, mm-hmm. what's, what would you be your advice to that, to that young version of Ryan or just a person right now out there wondering if they should get started creating something? Um, a couple of things. Number one, I think, and this is just painful. It's so painful to be young and to hear the advice that people my age now give, which is, it's even more painful because it's just true, is that the best thing to happen to your work is time. It's Hmm. just time. Living your life, having experiences, wandering about you know, wandering down the back alleys and finding yourself in places that you had not imagined, that will enrich your work in the long run more than just about anything. Hmm. And so I think as a young person, one of the best things that you can, one of the best ways to spend your time, I think, is exploring, like work in a different industry, hang out with different people, you know, get on an airplane if you can afford it, uh, you know, go drive around. I don't know. But I think that like it is much harder for me now, like with the responsibilities in my life to just wander. Mm. And I feel like that's an amazing thing in your in your early 20s in particular. I think just living as much as life as possible will pay dividends um, down the road for sure. And then the other thing is, is I think that like it goes hand in hand, but I think that like I, for me personally, I feel like sharpening your sense of intuition, like is an incredibly useful thing when you're young. Mm. Like if you feel like you should, like, I don't know, that subway guy's kind of interesting, you know, like I should film something with him or this director, I really liked their work. I feel like I should reach out. I don't know. I'm going to do that, you know, or this Every time I travel to the city, I just feel at home here, like move to that city. Mm. I think that that kind of sense of intuition of just like, I feel like I need to try this or do this or go here, whatever, that those like for me have been amazing, like points of intersection, you know, like it often is intuition is often the thing that reveals the next step that you need to take. The scary part's just doing it Mm. right. And so I think as a young person, I would definitely tell myself, like, follow your gut and listen to your intuition, uh, even if it feels very quiet and small. Mm. Trust yourself. Yeah, for sure. I love that. Ryan, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> of course. Where, where can people find you? What projects do you do you want to 
people to check out? Like, where do you want to, yeah. Where do you want to direct people? Yeah. Good question. Um, I have a funky relationship with social media at the moment, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I am still there. So uh, I'm just at Ryan Booth at both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and that, that'll be where most of the stuff that I kind of talk about will, will intersect there at least. So I think they can, people can, people can find me there for cool. sure. Yeah. I highly recommend everyone go follow Ryan on Instagram. I've been following you for a long time and I love the photos. I saw, I think it was yesterday, the day before, uh, you busted out the, the camera again, got some good, asked some strangers for, for oh, yeah. a portrait on the bridge, I think. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. I got a, I, uh, unintentionally, but every year basically I essentially get a new camera format and then I spend that year working on that camera format. Stills photography for me, I love, love, love taking photos. I would never do it for my job. I refuse to get paid to do it. It is like siloed from anyone. Mm-hmm. Like no one can have an opinion about my photography. Right. Like it is it is mine, mine, mine. And every year I get a new camera format and like spend the next year basically like learning what that format, like how that informs my process mm. and what the images kind of end up feeling like. And so this year I got a four by five large format camera and it is terrifying <laughs> yeah. it's terrifying to shoot and so yeah I, I lugged it up onto the bridge the other day and and made a portrait of a stranger which you know focusing and photographing it takes three to four minutes right. to like take a shot you know it's not just like oh that's cool mm-hmm. which i love that kind of photography too but you know four or five minutes with a stranger <laughs> yeah. uh you know in the snow on a bridge right. is is like a a lesson in the elasticity of uh, our perception of time. For sure. sure. It felt like three sure. hours. And you're like, please don't go. Please don't go. Please don't leave. Please yeah, don't exactly. leave. Please don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love I so. love that you talk about your photography being un- untouchable because I think everyone, oh, yeah. everyone needs a side project. Even if you work for yourself, I think everyone needs a side project that yes. you get to be a total control freak over. No one gets to tell you yes. anything about it. it. Just, I think it makes your, your yep. professional work a lot better because you're less precious because you're like cool i can yes i can bend here a little bit because i have my solo thing that no one gets to touch yep. and can be a control freak over but yeah i definitely resonate with 100%. that so cool yes everyone go follow <laughs> ryan on instagram so yeah thanks again man i really appreciate you being on of course thanks for having me sure and thanks to everyone for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to get more of these conversations sent directly to your inbox please head over to alexsug.com and sign up for my newsletter. And as always, please go leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Spotify has reviews now, so please go review it on Spotify. That helps us get more people listening. And last but not least, this episode was edited and produced by the one and only Josh Perez. And if you are looking for help with your podcast, Josh is the dude. He's a great producer and an even better human being. So please get in touch with him at just Josh Perez. Dot com, and I'll be back soon with another new episode. So until then, let's go make something cool. This episode of Make Something Cool was brought to you by Riverside, the leading podcast and video recording platform. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or the description of this video or podcast.